what you're going to be watching tonight is the first turn of an actual game that was played between myself and my son, Andrew, who is credited with contributing design on the game. He and I spent many, many sessions together. He made many great contributions. He uh, just turned 16, and that's a fruit that did not fall very far from the tree. My older son, Sean, who might join us as well, uh, also tested with his friends. So it was a, it was a great great project to do that with my sons. Anyway, because this is a, a replica of a real game, there will be a few places where I do things not randomly because I'm recreating something that happened in a previous game as opposed to actually playing a live game in front of you in Vassal, and I, I hope that's okay. Just some quick preliminaries here because I'm not sure what everybody knows. Conquistadors is a game about the conquest of the New World, the Spanish conquest specifically. It takes the point of view that the interesting conflict was between the different factions of Spaniards, not the Spaniards versus the English, since the English aren't even in the New World until the 17th century, nor the French. And it depicts the native peoples as both sometime allies and sometime enemies of the small bands of Spanish conquistadors, which is, is historically accurate for this period. So you begin with this the map, and there are actually two maps. There's a north map and a south map. And in four-player games or th even three-player games, typically you use both. In two-player games or playing solitaire, you typically choose just one. And for this game, I'm going to be playing on the north map. And the map shows you the rough outline of the Americas as it was known in about 1520. The approximate outline of the continent was known by that time. And it also depicts the physical geography, these land spaces here with numbers. Those are called levels, and they're quite important in the game. They roughly correlate to the height. The, the altitude above sea level. The more advanced native civilizations were found at the higher levels because there was less danger of malaria there. But in general, it was a healthier place to be. And just as you see Hilltown Society in Italy about the same time period and for the same reason. But what you do not know is where those native civilizations are. So you are embarked on a, a march of discovery into the interior and dealing with whatever comes at you. And as you will discover, a central principle of this game is great uncertainty and sudden change, because that's what leaped out at me most from reading the historical accounts of this period, how disaster and opportunity could both threaten around the next corner, sometimes at the, in the same moment, and the successful conquistadors were the ones who quickly adapted to take advantage of the opportunities and to avoid being destroyed by the disasters. So that is how the game plays. Change can be quite sudden. The play can sometimes be vicious. Desperate uh, actions can occur. There's some, uh, malaria if you're unlucky and human sacrifice if you're really unlucky. So that's what the game is about. All the spaces in the game are initially undiscovered, and they become discovered as you do operations of discovery. And you'll see how that works as we play through the turn. The sea spaces are simply places you can move around in sea movement which I won't be showing any of in the game. None, none of it occurred in this particular game. This is a game about the land conquest, the actions of the, uh, the various expeditions under people like Cortez and Pizarro. And for them, the ships were basically just like taxis transport to where the march began, and then they quickly disappear from the narrative. So there is no naval component to this game. That was essentially already over by the time the game begins. So let's get acquainted with a few of the playing pieces and, and other components. What you see out here on the map that I'm showing, or the display that I'm showing right now, is essentially what is visible to all the players all the time. And the most important pieces in the game are, of course, the conquistadors. We have there Diego de Almagro, who's sitting in a village that he has found. I'll talk about that in a little bit, talk about the setup and how we got here. There's uh, Hernan Cortez. My rollover is technique needs some work. Francisco Pizarro down here. And then up here, uh, Vasco Nunez de, de Balboa. So there are two factions in play. The blue faction was my son's position, and I'll go ahead and refer to that just for clarity. I'll say Andrew does this, Andrew does that, because he was in the game. And Andrew is controlling Cortez and Balboa, and Dad is controlling Pizarro 
and Almagro. So you have all the main historical conquistadors in the game, but you don't have them arriving at the same places or in the same expeditions. That's all determined during play. Each conquistador here corresponds to an expedition. You have over on the right-hand side of the map here, and this play mat, you have a conquistador card. So there's the card for Balboa popping up there, and it shows his ratings for rally and combat and diplomacy, which of course are very, very important in the game. You put the cards in front of you, basically, when you're playing, or here in the vassal, you put it on this nice play mat, and then the troops who are in the, in the expedition go on that card. So what we see here is Balboa has an expedition with six-foot soldiers. Those are, are six-foot units. Cortez has a much stronger army over here. He's got three-foot units. He's got, uh, well, sorry, this is three-foot units totaling six combat points. Here we have three three-foot units, we have a cannon unit, and then we have three horse units. So the numbers on the pieces there are the combat strengths. So you can see horses are by far the strongest valued unit. They also have some special abilities in combat. My reading of this period is that the weapon system consisting of the mounted man with a sword was utterly dominant in open combat on these fields. Gunpowder was not really that important. The foot units do have some gunpowder, but it was really the sword and the mounted man that made the difference. And so much of a difference that it's it's almost not too strong to say that the conquistadors were technologically and in military organization as far above the Incas and Aztecs as a modern battalion of Marines would be above the conquistadors. It was that that big a gap. But when things were in their favor, surprise, terrain, other advantages, the native peoples could actually have success. That happened several times in the New World, and it can happen in the game. I'm saying native peoples here in the conversation because that's the modern term we use, and that's fine. The game actually uses the term Indians, and that is because I was trying to create a consistent period feel in the game in a lot of ways, and I'll point that out more as we go through it. But to the Spaniards, these people were called the Indians, testimony to Mr. Columbus's poor comprehension of longitude, basically. He thought he'd reached the far, the far east and didn't want to admit that he hadn't, and the name, the name just stuck. So anyway, that's your conquistador card. These units, by the way, these are quite small bodies of men. For the foot soldiers, we're talking 25 to 50, maybe. The horses are about 5 to 10 soldiers. The Indian units, which come in randomly during the game, and you'll see how that works, those are much larger, some thousands. And we see in several places, that being one of them, that there are real limits to what we know here. If you're doing a game on the Civil War, which is one of my other periods, you know, you haul out the official records and you get exact statements down to the regimental level and below of exactly how many men were present and how many were sick and, uh, you know, how many were present for duty equipped and who was where and all of that. That type of documentation simply doesn't exist for this period. And these weren't regular armies, and it was all a long time ago. So I've had to take some good guesses and go for a game above all of narrative. But it doesn't have some of the specifics that a, a game about a more mainstream military topic would have. Some of the other pieces that you get in the game from time to time uh, represent things like gold and food. We'll talk about that as the play goes on. And then, of course, we have cards. So I'm just going to bring up a card deck here the blue faction's hand, and we'll bring it into play here. This game is card-assisted, but not actually card-driven. And the distinction there is that in a card-driven game, every game action is derivative of the play of a card. If you want to move something, you play a card. If you want some other action, you play a card. Here, the movement and combat are procedural, but the cards are very important in the play. So, and they are played as a supplement, as you will see. So just running through this hand here, and we'll talk about how the hand is built. Actually, we might as well talk about that right now. I did not want a design where the game was dictated to you by the card draw. In other words, I wanted the players to be in charge of the game and not the deck. So you get a lot of choices in how you make your 
card hand and the expectation is pretty much that you will burn through your entire hand every turn and then start a new one the next turn so it's not a, a game where you well with some exceptions it's not it's not so much a game where you nurse a few cards long way through the game and then play them at a critical moment that there are examples of that but you you generally use most of the hand each time you hold eight cards during the actual play and to begin with you draw up to 10 so i've shown a starting hand of 10 cards here you then discard two of those to get down to eight and before you do the card draw you're allowed to discard any leftover cards that you have in in your hand so basically with no penalty you can get a new hand every turn and you get some choices about what stays in your hand so in this particular example andrew got these 10 cards and i'll just run through them for you so you get some idea of what the cards are this is called a legend card and we'll see how that is in play it, uh, it has to do with the mississippi river a letter from the crown there are three basic types of cards in the game there are action cards well i should say four but three types of strategy cards in the game there are action cards there are combat cards and there are reaction cards action cards are things you do when you want during your turn you're allowed to play any number of them during the turn in any order combat cards are played during combat and reaction is played during somebody else's turn in response to something somebody else did. So I'm not going to go through the details of every one of these cards. I'll wait for that until we play them so it will make sense in combat and in context. So here we have an, an imperial emissary, uh, very important in the, in the history of Cortez. He, he met an emissary from the Mexican Empire, and that gave him an idea. It might be a good idea to march over the mountains and find it. This is an example of a reaction card. We'll see how it's played during the game but it's it can be played during a discovery action and uh, and have an effect on that and here's a combat card for example pits has an, an effect on combat another combat card cuts saddle straps and then an interesting card going on Let's see if i can get that to come up there we go buena suerte a ambos which means good luck to both of you in Spanish, approximately. I do not speak Spanish, but I have some dear friends who do, and they were kind enough to help me with the, the Spanish in this game. Allows two expeditions to move at once. Uh, another reaction card, this one against diplomacy action, a bad translation, which might affect something. And then mano de Dios, which is a very important concept that we'll get to when it comes up to play. So Andrew, having been dealt this starting hand, decided he didn't want the pits and he didn't want the cut saddle straps. So he discarded those and that was that got him down to his eight. OK. Why don't we do this? Mo, you can correct me, but the only way I would know to do this to look at the other hand is to retire like this. I'm currently blue. I want to switch to look at the white side. So let's do that. Let's say OK. Good deal. There we are. And so now we can bring up the white card deck. This was uh, my, my card deck when Andrew and I played this game. And let's uh, let's bring that up. So here we have, again, some combat cards and some reaction cards and some action cards which we'll we'll get to as as the game goes on and the ones that i decided i didn't want here were the ones called betrayal and treachery because both of those they were let me just say they were the least useful for the beginning turn of the game so since this is the beginning turn of the game i decided i would uh, would get rid of those i think actually there's a lovely way i can return this to the deck let's see yeah i can return that to the strategy deck right like that that's kevin put a lot of real nice features into this vassal uh, module so there we go so now we're down to the eight that i'm i'm actually going to play and one thing i want to mention is that all of these cards came from actual sources in the sense that they all, they aren't just things I made up out of my head. They're things which were referred to in what, some or another source material that I read. So this one here, which we won't actually see getting played in this game, and that's why I've, I've lingered on it for a moment. It's a reaction card you can play against uh, diplomacy, Viracocha. It's may be played against other, any player attempting a diplomacy action. The chief angrily rejects Spanish attempts at conversion, saying he prefers his own gods. And there's a subtraction from the dice roll for that. Viracocha being the supreme or creator god of the Incas. There's one for Aztec god as well, Huitzilopochtli. So anyway, we can put that away. 
And let me switch back to Andrew's side here, the blue, since he's going to be the first guy to play. We'll go ahead and we can get a turn started here. The game proceeds in game turns, and each of the game's turns is a sequence of impulses. And there's a nice little impulse track here that you can use to keep track of that. It is an uncertain a variable number of impulses. You always get at least three, and then after that, you start rolling dice at the end of each impulse to determine if the turn ends. So you never know exactly how many impulses there are going to be, but there will always be at least three in a turn. And then the game simply continues until somebody has won, until somebody's achieved the, uh, the required victory points. So I'll put the impulse marker here in the first impulse box. And now, as regards the specific setup, this is what is called the quick start setup. There is a standard setup and then a quick start setup. And in the standard setup, basically everybody begins either in Santiago de Cuba or in uh, Panama and usually travels by sea, although from Panama sometimes you can travel by land to where you want to start your exploration. And so there's a turn or two of sea movement and initial exploration. And what the quick start game does is telescope that and let us get into the action by basically giving you an initial or inviting you to make an initial setup that reflects what would be the first couple turns of exploration. So everybody starts with a two villages and a, a town and a couple of conquistadors. And these are the places where we chose to set up. So this is not a fixed setup. We rolled dice. Andrew got the first choice. He started Cortez here, placed Cortez in this stuff. I got the second choice and I put Pizarro over here. Andrew went third and set up uh, Balboa. And then I finished with uh, Almagro. The conquistadors, you each start with two and you're they're randomly drawn from a subset of the better conquistadors so that everybody is guaranteed to get at least one reasonably good conquistador. And then the weaker conquistadors come into the game as the uh, game progresses, there are actually cards for them. And they're, they're well, they're, you see their cards, the Conquistador cards, those are shuffled into the strategy deck. And you proceed drawing them from the deck, and you can add them to your hand and buy troops for them and so forth. As I say, pretty much all the well-known Conquistadors are there, some not so well-known. There are two two particular conquistadors that the artist came back to me and said, I can't find pictures of these guys online. And they were Andres del Sur, Andrew of the South, and Tomas de los Primeros, Tom, Thomas of the First. And that's Andrew Southard and Tom Lee, who had made such contributions to the game. Andrew is, is co-designer and Tom is head play tester. I thought they deserved their own conquistador pieces. So we won't see them in the game here, but they are there. Any questions just kind of on this preliminary that I've gone over before we actually start moving pieces and playing cards and stuff? Anything I can answer right now? Yeah, this is Rich. I got a yeah, hi, um, Rich. hey, nothing major, but okay. So on your circles, it, the numbers represent elevations. I'm seeing twos that are in the water and on the land and on the coast. Sure. Yeah. It, if I said that the numbers actually represent elevations, that was a misspeak, and I'm sorry for that. They actually correlate to elevations. In other words, the higher numbered ones are generally higher, the lower numbered ones are generally lower. So there's not an exact correlation, you know. Now, as far as why some of them are in the water and some of them aren't, Central America is a pretty narrow place. It's an extremely inconvenient shape for a game board. And the choice was, well, we could either zoom in on just say a very small part of it like maybe just central mexico and do a game about that you'd really lose a lot it wouldn't be about the age of conquest anymore it would be about one particular conquest so i wanted to get the the caribbean on the on the map here and that dictated a certain scale so those places that are in the water are not actually in the water they're more like on the coast does that help okay. at all yeah no that's yeah. fine uh and the other question was, over on the left side of the map, you've got L's and D's. 
Oh, yeah, I didn't talk about that. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you very much. And actually, it's a great time to answer it because we're going to go ahead and start with the play. And I'm going to bring up Andrew's card deck and let's uh, let's talk about that. So uh, his first play is going to involve the L space here. So I'll answer your, you know, I'll, I'll tell you all about those as, as I do this. Let me just note, though, that in an impulse, you're allowed to play as many of your action cards as you want in any order at any time during the impulse. Other players are allowed to play as many of their reaction cards as they want at any time that those cards are applicable. So there, each card is only allowed to be played in response to certain types of actions, so that's when they're allowed to play them. And you are also allowed to move typically one expedition move and do actions with one expedition, although sometimes two, as you will see in just a moment. So Andrew's first card play was this card right here. Let me bring his hand back onto the map and we'll show it to you. His first card play was Legend of the Mississippi. May be played any time the Mississippi legend is not on the map. Place the Mississippi legend in any unoccupied L space of the North map. So that's the L space you were asking about. D is desert, by the way, but L is the interesting one. So what are the legends? As I mentioned, this is a, a game of point of view. During the Age of Exploration, there were lots of stories, some of them fanciful, some of them partly true but incomplete, all of them highly distorted, all of them very wondrous about things that were out there to be found. Prester John, the king who supposedly ruled over a kingdom of Christians somewhere in Central Africa. El Dorado, the golden man. The Fountain of Youth, by the way, another one. And then there were a couple like the Mississippi River and the Amazon, which were actually true. So I decided that to give you an accurate point of view, we needed to have these legends in the game and there needed to be a prospect that they are true. So there is actually a prospect that you will find El Dorado in the game, but not a very high prospect, as you will see. There's somewhat a larger prospect that you might succeed in descending the Mississippi River. So Andrew plays this card, and we'll go ahead and return it, place it in the discard pile. There we go. And then I have the Mississippi piece ready over here, and he's going to place it right there. So his initial spot was carefully chosen for this play. So this is the equivalent kind of of, you know, opening the half in the Super Bowl by throwing a pass and hoping it goes 75 yards for the touchdown because he's going to make a try at finding the Mississippi and there is some chance it will actually work. So that's his play. Now his next play, if I bring his hand back, he's going to play this card, Buena Suerte a Ambos. The player may move and do an action with two separate in expeditions in the same impulse. No conquistador can be moved twice in the same impulse. So he uses his Buena Suerte a Ambos card, and that's going to let him move both of his expeditions in the same impulse. His first action is to move Mr. Balboa to this space here. Now, how does movement work? An expedition can move up to two spaces of which the last is a undiscovered space. So if it moves directly to an undiscovered space, it has to stop there. If the first space it moved into was discovered, it can move to and end in an undiscovered space. Or if it's moving all through discovered spaces, which doesn't often happen, it can move three. When it enters an undiscovered space, meaning a level zero, one, two, three, or four, it has to stop. And then it performs an action called discovery, which is very fundamental to the game. So let me bring the charts and tables in. So here's the discovery table. It's very fundamental to play. And you can see we cross-reference the level of space in which we are discovering with a, a die roll, a six-sided die roll. Okay, And there are a few modifiers. The most important modifier is one called the adjacent civilization modifier that I'll talk about a little more as we get into some of the more, more interesting spaces. What the adjacent civilization module modifier basically does is 
make it very difficult to jump more than one level at a time. You can go from zero to one, you can go from one to two, you can go from two to three, you can't go from zero direct to four. You will not be able to discover anything. So it forces the discovery to go in this gradual kind of process, which it actually did, beginning by discovering villages, then towns, then cities, and finally empires, which is where the, where the, the large amounts of gold are. So Balboa rolls a die, and I'll be doing all the die rolls offline because, as I say, I am re re repeating a game that we already played. Andrew's die roll in this case was a four, so he found a village. So we'll take that and we'll drag that over into this space, and bam, there we go. We have a village. Balboa has discovered a village. Okay, great. Andrew played the Buena Suerte a Ambos card, so he gets to move his other expedition as well. This is Mr. Cortez. He's going to move to this level two space here and do discovery again. So let's bring back the table, okay, and take a, take a look at it. Now he's in a level two space, but he has a town adjacent to him, okay? So if we look at the adjacent civilization modifiers here, we are in a level two space, but we have a town adjacent. So the modifier is zero. If we only had a village adjacent and no and no town, that would be a minus three. That would be very hard. And if we didn't have anything adjacent, it would be an X, meaning you can't find anything. Because you just didn't, it didn't happen that they walked through the jungle and suddenly came upon a massive imperial city. That's not how it was. They came to villages first and then smaller towns and then larger towns and cities and so forth. That was the, the actual process that discovery followed. So we are in a level two space. We have a, a zero modifier. And Andrew's die roll in this particular case was a four, so he gets a town. So let's go ahead and bring a town piece onto the map. And there we go. Andrew's found a town. Very good. That was all of Andrew's move. He didn't have any other cards to play, so it became my move. And I didn't want to play any of my strategy cards just yet. What I wanted to do is discover something. So I took Mr. Alamagro here and moved him to try to discover something in the space. Now that's a level one space and there is a village adjacent. So let's go ahead and bring the charts back. Good, so here's the discovery table. So we are in a level, level one space, as you can see. And the modifier for adjacent civilization is again going to be zero. And my die roll in this particular case was a one, which was really unfortunate. I didn't find anything. So that discovery failed. Okay. By the way, there are these uh, little white circles here. Those are modifiers to the discovery rolls. They make it less likely you will find anything and more likely you will find mosquitoes. They actually correlate with the actual layout of malaria as it still is, unfortunately, in Central America. I, I was guessing that it probably was pretty much the same then. So that's that's where those spaces, uh, those spaces come from. So that's the end of the first impulse, fairly typical first impulse so far, except for Andrew's play against the, uh, the Mississippi here, which is unusual. Andrew decided to move Cortez to this level three space here in the hopes of doing discovery. And this is obviously a good position to be in because he has two different level four spaces adjacent. So two possible chances to find an empire or to find something something else useful. So I decided at that point it was time to time to do something about this. So we will go ahead and switch to the white side, which is my side. There we go. And we will bring the card deck up and take a look at my options for card play. And the card I decided to play was this one here called Indian Ambush. May be used against any expedition attempting discovery in a level one or higher space. Draw some units and attack. And there's a reference to the, the little paragraph in the rules that describes exactly how that's done. And what you will find if you go look at that is you're actually supposed to draw two units randomly. So as I say, since we are repeating a game that has already been done, I have the units already here. I haven't uh, 
uh, we since we we already drew them and I wanted to replicate what we actually did. There is a 40 strength unit, and here is a 15 strength unit. So those are pretty strong. The 40 unit has the interesting property that it has it is back printed. The the heavier Indian units are back printed. So you can see if I were to flip that over, it becomes a 15. There it's on its full side of 40. And you'll discover in just a moment how that works with the combat. But there is a little bit more card play to do first. In addition to the Indian ambush, I decided to play this card, Painted Warriors. Play in any combat involving Indian units. All Indian units in this combat are doubled. Does not, however, apply to Indian allied units, which are part of a Spanish expedition. As we will see later, Indian cities can ally themselves with the Spanish, and in that case, troops from those cities join the Spanish expedition. And that's exactly what happened with Cortez, and that's actually how Cortez was able to take Mexico, was with the aid of his Indian allies, who were not so worried about Cortez and his small number of men, but really were very uh, much enemies of the of the Mexica, the Aztecs. So we will go ahead and place the Indian ambush in the discard pile. We'll place the painted warriors in the discard pile. And I'm going to go ahead and up the ante on this. I'm all in at this point. I'm also going to play this card called Human Sacrifice. May be played in any combat between Indians and Spanish. The Spanish force immediately takes one morale hit. So his, he's going to get a, a morale marker. If any Spanish unit suffers a hit in the combat, shift the governor index one box left, in addition to any shift for eliminated units. The colonial governor in the game is a non-player character, and everybody has what's called a governor index. Having a good governor index, meaning it's been shifted to the right, one, two, three, you know, positive numbers is good. Good things happen for you. Having a negative governor index is bad. It makes it harder to raise troops. You lose victory points for it. Other things can happen. What's going on here is that the colonial governor does not like to be told that some of his king's subjects have been eaten or offered as human sacrifices. He doesn't like that. That's why, you know, where this where this card came from. And of course, you know, as we all know, the Aztecs did practice human sacrifice and practiced it on some of the uh, of the conquistadors whom they took prisoner. So we will go ahead and place that in the discard pile. I have played that, so I've, I'm down to five cards now. Andrew, on the other hand, will go ahead and switch to his side. Andrew is going to have a card in response. And so he's the blue player, so we'll do that. We'll bring up his deck. Here is the blue faction's hand. Andrew plays a card, Tactical Advantage. Okay, It's a pretty significant card, actually. In the first round of combat, may roll first and apply results before the other side gets to roll. So combat is in rounds. Each side rolls and determines losses inflicted on the other. Normally, that is simultaneous. But in this case, it is saying he gets to go first in the first round of combat only and extract losses from me before my guys get to get to roll. It's interesting. We're all used to games where there's fire combat, and that's the primary mode of combat. So I, the, the playtesters invariably said, fire, I'm going to fire, it's my turn to fire, and so on, even though actually nearly all the weapons here are edged. There are very few actual fire weapons in this game. That's the card play. Let me just make sure I put that in the discard pile. There we go. Okay, good. So, combat. Let's see how that works. Let's go ahead and bring up the combat table. You can think of it, as I said, like a fire table, although it's not actually fire, it's simply losses. We have combat factors across the top, and then two dice. So you're rolling. Sometimes game rolls are two dice, sometimes they're one die. Each table will tell you which it, which it is, whether it's two or one. And the most important modifiers, well, the most important modifier by far is the combat rating of your conquistador, and then you get a plus one if the force possesses any artillery. There are also negative rolls for morale, and remember, his force has one morale hit at, uh, at this point because of the human sacrifice. Andrew's force is Cortez's over here, so he's got 24 for the three uh, horse units, Add six to that for these guys, the foot, and then add three for the artillery. So it's a total of 33. His die roll modifier is 
two for Cortez's combat. So Cortez, had, he is one of the two best conquistadors in the game, the other being Pizarro. A two in rally, a two in combat, and a three in diplomacy. Cortez was was unexcelled in that in that sphere. Pizarro is a little bit the inverse. He's also a two in rally. He's a three in combat, more of a, a straight soldier. Only a two in diplomacy. But those are those are very good ratings. Obviously, both both of them. We are on the thirty column here, and we're adding th two for Cortez and one for the artillery. The die roll Andrew got was a seven, so we add one, two, three, and that's two hits. So what that does is it destroys this unit. Okay, remember in this case it's being it's being applied first, so that unit is gone. And now this unit takes a hit and is flipped over to the 15 side. So now I get to fire back. And I have the 15, but I double that because of my Painted Warriors card that I played, if you remember, which doubles the value of Indian units here. So let's bring the fire table up again. There we go. So that makes 30. Okay, so I'm on the 30 column. I don't have a Conquistador. My die roll was 10, and that's two hits. Now, all the Spanish units in the game can take two hits, and the first one, well, they can take one, and the effect of the one is to be flipped over. So he's going to flip that horse over, and I'm going to flip that horse over. I, I get to choose it, and of course, I want to flip over two horses. The first hit doesn't have any adverse effect on the unit's capabilities, but if it takes a second hit, it's destroyed. You cannot inflict a second hit on any unit in a round in the same round until all the units in the army have taken at least one hit. So that's why I had to flip over two. However, in a second round, if I get more losses in a second round, I can apply that loss in the second round to one of those flipped horse units. I don't have to flip everybody over. It just applies to one round. So there's a there's an incentive to keep the keep the rounds going. The longer the Indians can hold on, the more chance they have of actually destroying somebody, which is a is a big deal because as you can tell, there aren't a lot of Spanish units in the game, so losing one really matters. So then we go to the second round. Cortez has the same value and so without difficulty he's going to destroy that unit but i still have this time we fire simultaneously there is no tactical advantage so i get to roll again on that same 30 column this time i rolled a six which was one hit so that actually does destroy one of cortez's units so that destroys that now the combat is now over and so we flip this horse unit back up, and it's it's no no harm done. It's uh, it's back to full capability. However, Cortez suffered a hit, and as you recall, because of the human sacrifice, that means he lost one in the governor's favor. And every time the Spaniards lose a unit, that is also minus one in the governor's favor. So Andrew is down two now in governor's favor. One for the horse, and one for the human sacrifice. There are some advanced game rules that provide some more special abilities for the horses. So it's an option there, but I thought this was enough to show for this particular game. Well, Andrew is going to go ahead and finish his discovery in this space. And he actually gets a plus one to his discovery roll because of the ambush. And the idea is that huge army that he just defeated had to come from somewhere. It didn't come from empty jungle. So he gets a, a, a plus one, a favorable modifier for his discovery. It's a level three space and it has only a town adjacent. So if we look on the adjacent civilization modifiers, we see that's a minus one modifier. The minus one cancels the plus one, so it's a straight up die roll. And he rolled a four, which means he gets a city. And that's a big deal because cities is what you really want to get in this game. Cities can become your allies. Cities can supply you with gold. Cities can supply you with troops. Cities are good things to have. And cities also are the stepping stones to discovering empires. So Cortez succeeded there, albeit with the loss of one of his valuable horse units. So let's switch back over now to my side of the mountain. We will switch back to white so that I can bring up my hand. There are a couple of cards that I decided to play at this moment. 
The first one is this one, the arrest warrant. Target must be out of favor with the governor. That means a negative governor's favor index, which Andrew now has. And it means anyone may attack the units of the target faction. So basically, in order for Spanish units to attack each other, there either has to be an arrest warrant in play or there are a few other cards which will allow it to happen. But it's primarily it's through arrest warrants. There was an arrest warrant issued for Cortez, as you know, during his career. Troops were sent to attack to attack him. He did some fast talking and convinced them to join him instead. And that incident almost could be said to be one of the starting points for this game, because it was when I read that, I realized there's a need for a new game on this topic, because nothing I'd never seen anything like that happen in, a, in an Age of Discovery game before. It, it can happen in this one. So that's the arrest warrant. And when we play it, typically you put it out on the map and you, you put it next to the player against whom it's been played. But I'll, I'll just clear it out of there. Uh, so we know that that was all the uh, all the card play that I that I wanted to do at, at this point. But I do want to move Mr. Pizarro and get something going on with him. So I will move him to this level two space here. That's a nice space because it has several adjacent level three spaces. And you have to think about that as you play a little bit, because if I should fail in discovery in one of these level three spaces, it's good to have alternatives. So there's a kind of central position effect that you think about as you work your way through the board. It is possible, by the way, for uh, sections of the map to be sort of cut off. If you look at this on the southern map, if you get a bad, an adverse discovery result in these two spaces here that I'm pointing to, then this whole section of the map, which could have been an empire, is cut off and does not come into play, which of course was true. Historically, there never was an empire there, but there could have been one had history turned out a little differently. And there is also a card which allows you to remove discovered markers from a space, it's a, to recycle them, in other words, so that you can open something up for discovery again. Historically, that would correlate to getting more information or you know, getting another map or somebody coming and telling you something. That's kind of what it would simulate historically. But so it is possible for sections of the map to be reopened in, in that way as well. So Pizarro moves to the level two space. I won't go through all the details of it again, but it's the same discovery process. And suffice it to say that he did find a town. So that is the end of the second impulse. So Andrew, as luck would have it, or my bad luck would have it, possessed this card. Letter from the Crown cancels an arrest warrant. Now that can be one that was played against you or played against somebody else. You know, there's sometimes it's a good idea to do that. You do see some cooperation in the game between players, but you don't see alliances. It's not like diplomacy, say, where you ally with somebody and then suddenly cut their throat. You're basically trying to cut everybody's throat all the time. And if there's occasional cooperation or convenience, that's fine. But it isn't the same as, as a game where you think you trust people and then suddenly discover you can't. If you trust anybody in this game, you, you didn't quite get the concept. You know, these are desperate men out for gold. So Andrew played the, the letter from the crown, and he decides to move Balboa. Now, Balboa can move right through the desert. You don't have to stop there for discovery. He moves into the space with the Mississippi, and he tries to find the legend. Now, that process of finding a legend is not the same as normal discovery. There is a separate table for it, which is the legends table. And these are the different legends you can have in the game, the Amazon and the Mississippi, the Fountain of Youth, the Seven Cities, El Dorado, and Prester John. Prester John was actually more an African thing, but I thought, what the heck, let's put him in this game too. I mean, he's a, he's a fictitious character, so we can do what we want. What you will discover is that the way this table works the good results for the player are down here on 11 and 12 on two dice. Basically, if you roll the 11 or 12, if you look at this line, really nice things happen to you and you get a lot of victory points. So in the case of the Fountain of Youth, that means you found the Fountain of Youth. A spa is discovered whose waters appear to have a remarkable rejuvenating effect. Spaniards declare it to be the Fountain of Youth. Remove any morale hits on expedition. Flip marker to found side. Very nice. On the other hand, for something like the Mississippi, for example, result C is the good one. Expedition descends entire length of major river. 
remove expedition from play and return at Panama or Santiago de Cuba, whichever is closer at the start of the next turn, flip marker to found side. So that means the thing was real and you found it. And as you know, the Amazon was descended during this period by Oriana who was killed attempting to repeat the fact. But then A and B, which are much more likely outcomes, are not so favorable for you. A is expedition meets with a serious accident, and which can be a fatal disaster or you just get lost for a long time and you don't accomplish anything. B is, well, you discover the river, but you can't descend it, leave the marker in place and so on. So there's a small chance of something with a lot of value. In the case of the Amazon and the Mississippi, since they were real, the chance of that high payoff is twice as big as for the others. So Andrew, in this case, rolled a two, which is X, expedition commander dies in accident, leave marker in place. And I was being pretty smug about that. And then he made a card play, which is this one, Mano de Dios. Mano de Dios is Spanish for hand of God. And the Spanish conquistadors firmly believed that they were carrying out their God's will in doing these expeditions, that they were conquering. You know, they were there to get gold, but they were also there to spread the spread their faith. And they believed that God would watch over them in tight places. And that's what this Mano de Dios is trying to capture. You get some of them as action cards like this, just drawn from the deck, but you get them mostly as a result of diplomacy actions. And that's because it was in the, that diplomacy process that the attempts at conversion were done. I didn't want to put a conversion thing in the game explicitly. I didn't see the need for that. But when the Spaniards would come into a new town and try to do diplomacy, the first thing they would do is put someone from the expedition or a missionary if they had one front and center and he would read this thing to the natives who probably didn't understand any of it but it was it was basically about the the spanish church and faith and and so on so it's a historical reality i wanted it to be there and i wanted them this this idea that you could be saved from in desperate moments by by the hand of god in this case andrew is going to use it to re-roll the roll. You can use this, you can play these at any time on virtually any role in the game, almost any role, except the ones to end the impulse and initiative. You can't use it for either of those. And he, so he's going to use it to, to re-roll this roll. And the second time up, he rolls a 10, which, as you recall, meant a successful descent. So that's a very typical use of Mano de Dios. Andrew's strategy makes a little more sense given that he had that card. So basically, Mississippi... Not sure what happened to the marker. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The marker would be flipped to its found side, and Andrew gets 60 victory points. There is a track for that in the game, but I won't bother to scroll up there and show it to you. Just just know that Andrew has uh, has 60 victory points. The expedition, however, Balboa, per the terms of the card, is now removed from play and for the remainder of the turn because it takes a long time to descend the Mississippi. So he is, oh, there we go. There's the Mississippi. Let's see if I can flip it to the to the found side. Nope, that's all right. It doesn't matter. He'll come back at uh, either Santiago de Cuba or Panama next turn. And I can put him wherever he wants, but he's he's off descending, descending the Mississippi successfully. So meanwhile, what I do in my impulse is I'm going to move Pizarro. Let's scroll down just a tiny bit. I'm going to move Pizarro to this level three space. Once again, this central position idea, I'm in between two four spaces here, so that's a pretty nice place for me to be. And I will go ahead and roll for discovery, but we're going to see some card play as part of that. So let me switch over to my hand. So the card I'm going to use is local guide and a plus one die roll modifier to one discovery attempt against any level space. Discard after using. So there's my local guide. I will put that in the discard pile. That gives me a plus one in discovery. Let's see if we've got the, the charts uh, handy. Uh, there we go. Okay, good. I'm in a level three space. I have a plus one because of the local guide. I roll a three modified to a four 
and I get a city, which is what I was was hoping for, because as, as I say, cities are a good thing to have. So let me go ahead and grab that city counter over here. Uh, there's our city. So Pizarro has found the city. Then that's the end of the third impulse. You notice in impulse three, it's automatic. We continue. We continue to the next impulse. But there is a chance this impulse would be the last one. And that chance increases as you go on. It's never guaranteed. You could, in principle, keep having impulses for a very long time, but the odds get, get very, very low, of course. Let me switch back to Andrew's side. He is going to move Cortez down to this level four space, and he's going to try to discover in level four. And his hope, of course, is that he finds an empire. To help that process along, he is going to play a card called Imperial Emissary gives a plus one die roll modifier to one discovery attempt against a level four space only. Only one emissary may be used per roll. This card after using. So Andrew gets a plus one, which is uh, is a good thing for him because finding finding empires is what you really want to do and it isn't always easy. His discovery die roll, he's in the level four column. His adjacency modifier is going to be zero. So he rolls a three, it becomes a four, an empire. Okay, he's found a, found an empire. So what is that exactly? Well, let me, let me bring this up here and I'll show you. An empire consists of a capital and two other cities and a king. One of So it's three cities, basically, one of which is the capital. And one of those cities always goes in the space where the discovery occurred, which is this one, where Cortez is. The other two go in the nearest two level four spaces. And there's some verbiage in the rules explaining exactly what that means. But essentially, it's you count through and the, the, the ones that are the shortest distance away in terms of connections through the map. And in case of ambiguity, you roll a die. You determine randomly which of those is the capital. And in this particular case, the one that Andrew drew, this city here, that became the capital. And then the other two cities were, therefore, automatically this one and this one. So there's the empire. So this is roughly correlates to the Mayan empire, which, as you know, was in it had largely decayed away by the time the actual Spaniards arrived, but the ruins are still there in Central America. So what's happened in historical terms in our game is that the Mayan Empire was still a very much a going concern, and Cortez found the Mayan Empire instead of finding the Mexican Empire, which is over here where, where Pizarro is. We also have a king, and the king always goes in the capital city, which is right down there. Possession of the king can give you some leverage over the empire. You can use it to obtain more gold. There are various card plays possible, but there are also card plays which become possible against you. There's a card, for example, called Free the King, which someone can use to raise troops and try to free the king if you're holding him captive. That card can only be played against somebody who's holding the king. Right now, Andrew's not holding the king. He's just got this imperial city, which he's going to try to take advantage of. He does get five victory points for being the first to find an empire, so that'll push his current total to 65. I'm still looking for my first victory point in this game. But things can swing pretty fast, as I, as I mentioned, so I'm not, I'm not worried yet. One thing I should mention about these empires is that, the, or, or kingdom, I mean, either word works, they aren't quite the same as European empires were. They aren't nearly as cohesive. Basically, what you've got is three cities here, which are now, for most game purposes, more or less independent cities. It's not like with the English kingdom of approximately the same time. If you raided Southampton, you were also at war with London. That's not quite the way things were here. So I, I just mentioned that in, in case you know any, it should be confusing to anyone. We are dealing with with these Indian uh, empires, and not you shouldn't think of them exactly the same way as modern European ones. Okay, so over to me, my turn, and I am going to have Pizarro do diplomacy with this city that he is in a diplomacy action. And the card I'm going to play is called Trade Goods. 
It's a plus one modifier to a diplomacy die roll versus any space. So that gives me a plus one for this die roll that we're about to do, and I'll explain how that all works in just a moment. But Andrew's got something to say about it before I do that. He's got a card to play as well. So we will go ahead and look at the at his hand, the blue hand, and the card Andrew is going to play is this one here. Bad translation. Now you see this is a reaction card. It can be played against diplomacy actions. So as I mentioned, reaction cards are specific to the thing you're reacting against. Bad translation may be played against any player attempting to diplomacy. That would be me. Target player subtracts two from dice roll for this diplomacy action. So it's a, it's a, a two, two d six roll. So I'm subtracting two from a, a roll of uh, of two to twelve. No effect, however, if the expedition doing diplomacy has an interpreter card. An interpreter card is one of those assets that I mentioned. I haven't had a chance to get any assets yet. I'm hoping to get one in this diplomacy action, but right now I don't have that. Andrew will hit me there with the bad translation card. So that's going to mean a net die roll modifier of minus one, plus one and minus two on diplomacy. So here's the diplomacy table. This is a typo here. It's actually 2d6, not 1d6. This is not, by the way, the published version of the charts. Like I say, this is a PDF that I've, I've brought to the party tonight, and I'm going to be subtracting one. And you can see the outcomes range from the place being hostile to you all the way up to the place being allied with you, and perhaps even you're capturing the king. And you can get gold and you can get assets as a, as a result of this. So this is a pretty important table. The game presents you a choice. You can obtain gold in small quantities from diplomacy, and you will keep the Indian city friendly to you because they're willing to keep giving you gold in small quantities. If small quantities aren't fast enough for you, there is another option called plunder that we're going to learn about in a little while, where you get gold very fast, but you also turn the city hostile. There's some choices to make there. And you, you, you really need to do both. Neither one is always the, the right thing to do. So anyway, here I am with Cortez. I've played trade goods. Andrew's played bad translation, so it's a, mi a net of minus one. I roll the die. The roll I get is a 10, but it becomes a 9 because of that minus one. So here's my result. Food point, choose a gold or asset card, and if hostile, becomes neutral. So it would make them a little more friendly, although they're not really close to being allied with me. So the food point is good for reasons we shall discover. Every expedition needs to be provisioned each turn. It needs to eat. And you can either do that by being in an allied city, in which case your allies are presumed to feed you, or you can do it by getting gold from a diplomacy action, as in this case. So I will go ahead and take that food point and bring it onto Pizarro's expedition. So that will be food to feed my army for the end of this turn. So that's good. I'm happy about that. And then I said I get a choice. I either can get some gold or I can get an asset. What's that all about? Well, the choice of gold means that I'm going to do another roll on this diplomacy gold table. And you can see there's a couple modifiers for that. And this is a number of gold points that I get. So I could get quite a lot or I, I could get, get none. You know, this is the range. The choice of asset, on the other hand, is I get to pick a card from the assets deck and add it to my expedition. Now, strategy cards, the ones we've been playing so far, are held secret in each player's hand. And you've seen me been flip-flopping between Andrew's hand and mine. Asset cards are not. Asset cards are public and they're attached to an expedition. So they would go on the, on the play mat. I don't have an immediate need for gold right now. So I'm going to go ahead and get an asset card because assets can be really useful. And we'll just go ahead and, and draw one here. There we go. So we'll just bring that over onto Pizarro's expedition here. I'll just put it there. Interpreter. So this allows me to modify both diplomacy roles and any ensuing diplomacy gold roles with, with an interpreter, but eventually I may lose the interpreter as well. And there are other ways I can lose it as well, desertion or smallpox. Cortez, as, as you know, if you've read the history of this period, had a native interpreter. He had several, actually, one of whom became his, his wife, native wife. Uh, her name was Malinche. Still a very interesting figure in the history of Mexico. Uh, she was, was quite, uh, quite central to his success. So let's go ahead and scroll up here back to the, back to the map, and we'll go ahead and zoom out 
a little bit. So Pizarro has that interpreter card to be used for future diplomacy actions. So that is the end of the fourth impulse. And checking up here, we will see that there is a chance on the fourth impulse that the turn will end. It roll, ends like you have to roll two dice. It doesn't matter who rolls it. It ends on a two or a three. We did not roll a two or three on this game, so we proceeded to the fifth impulse, which is going to be the last one of the turn. The turn ended after this impulse, although, of course, we didn't know that when we were playing. Andrew decided to get some gold. One reason being that he wanted to make a gift of gold to the governor. I'll explain how that works in just a minute, but also Andrew just likes gold. So he um, decided to plunder this imperial city that he had found. So plunder is the other basic action. We've talked about movement. We've talked about diplomacy. We've talked about combat. There is also rally, which you can use to, to get rid of morale hits. But then the last of these actions is called plunder. This is an imperial city. We don't have any hostages. We don't hold the king captive. And this is the first plunder attempt this turn. So there are there are no uh, no modifiers. Andrew rolled a, a four. So he got 25 gold. A die roll of four in an imperial city is 25. So he got 25 gold points. So let's talk a little bit about how that works. Gold and money are in the game in three forms. Initially, you get gold. That is what That is what you get through diplomacy and through plunder. You can choose then to convert that gold to either pesos or victory points. And that's a one-way conversion. It can't be converted back from pesos to gold or victory points to gold. And you can't convert between pesos and victory points. Pesos are spendable money that you can use to raise more units and for a few other purposes in the game, but primarily to raise units. So it's the money you use to run your expedition. Victory points, on the other hand, is what you came here to get. That represents gold that you have sent back to Spain. So you have a choice, really, of how fast you're going to accrue victory points versus how much you're going to spend on, on more forces. And it's, it's an important uh, decision to have in the game. Now, Andrew plundered the city, and so he then has to roll 2d6s to determine if the city is plundered out, plunder exhaustion. And for each additional plunder attempt you do in the same turn in a given space, the more likely that becomes. So in this particular instance, he rolled a four on two dice. The city was plundered out. So that was the end. That was the end of his city. So that means the plunder is all exhausted from uh, from that city. So Cortez is not not very happy about uh, about that at all. I should mention, though, I'm sorry, I forgot something pretty important. Apologize for that, which is that the Indians don't simply sit around and watch you plunder the city. You actually have to fight them. When he declares the plunder action, it makes the city hostile and you draw units for the city. And in this case, he actually drew three rather rather weak units. Let me see if I can find them over here. Yeah, there they are. Okay, these these guys here. So he drew, we drew, a, I drew, I should say, an eight, and then a five. Scrolling up, anybody? There we go. And then a 10. So I wasn't too happy about that because I was hoping to get some more hits on Cortez with this Indian force. You know, it's an imperial city, so you draw three units. But this is only 23 points worth of combat, which is about as weak as you're going to get for, for an Indian force of, of three units. But oh well, that's what it is. So these fight. Andrew's force is now down to 25 because he lost one of those horse units. If we go ahead and, and bring the, the combat table up here. Let's find the find the combat table. It's up here. We use the 24 column, and he's still got the plus plus two die roll modifier for his leader, Cortez, plus one for the artillery. So he rolled a seven, which became a ten. So that was that was two hits. And and each of those weak Indian units is eliminated by a single hit. So that's that's two of those destroyed. Now, he didn't have a tactical advantage in this game. So these guys will get to fire at him at the same time. So they have 8 plus 5 is 13, plus 10 is 23. So they use the 20 column. I, I have no modifiers to my roll. I rolled an 8, uh, which is one hit. 
one of Cortez's units is going to get flipped over. So there we go. On the other hand, my two strongest units are going to go away. So there we are. So we go to a second round. Andrew's strength is the same. So he is easily able to eliminate that hit, that, that unit. And then there's only five combat points left. So they actually accomplished nothing. So they didn't eliminate his, uh, his unit. So anyway, I'm sorry, I forgot to do that combat before plundering. I apologize for that being a little confusing, but you fight the combat, then you do the plunder. And then that brings us back to where we are now uh, with the city plundered out and with Andrew sitting with, uh, with 25 points. Andrew did, however, decide to do one more thing in this turn, which is he converted some of his, uh, he used some of his gold. Uh, he's got these 25 points of gold and he decided to make some use of it. And the first thing he did was to give a gift of gold to the governor in the hope of shoring up his relations with the governor. So you can make a gift of gold to the governor, and here's the table for that. Basically, you have a, a gift consists of three points, and then for every uh, additional three points, you get another plus one on your on your roll on two dice. Andrews decided to just give three, and he rolled a four. So the governor received the gift politely, but was not impressed. No change in the governor's governor index. It is at least better than if he'd rolled a two. Governor is insulted by the small size of the gift. Discrete, decrease your index by one. That at least did not happen. So then Andrew decided to do a what is called a division of gold. And he decided to take 20 of the remaining points and do a division of gold. And what that means is actually dividing the gold among the men in the expedition. And it's an unfortunate place where you have to do just a tiny bit of math. The rule was, or the law was, that a fifth of all the gold findings went to the king. So one fifth of the gold being divided went to the king. So that's four out of the 20 points. And then all the guys in your expedition want their share. So for every two horse units and every four foot or artillery units, you have to deduct one point of gold. So Andrew had two, point, two horse units, that's one point, four of non-horse units, that's another point. So basically he gives four to the king, he gives two to his troops, and that leaves him with a net of 14 victory points that he can book. So his victory point now total was 79. 200, by the way, is needed to win. So he gave three to the governor, he, convert, he divided 20, and then he can, decided to convert the remaining gold to pesos. So he, he has, uh, has two pesos to spend, and that, that would be used to buy more units, although I'm not, not going to show that part. Well, my last move in a turn was I moved Al Magro. I had failed to find anything here. So I moved him through this village, which is already discovered. So remember, I can move him on right there. And I moved to this space here and tried to discover there. And unfortunately, I found nothing except, as luck would have it, mosquitoes. So again, I, I know you know how to do exploration at this point, so I won't go through that. But that was kind of unfortunate. So there is my mosquito marker. Honest to goodness, mosquitoes, which is not, not a good thing for me. So that was the end of the impulse, and we rolled a die at that point to determine end of turn, and in this case, we rolled a five, which means the end of the game turn. The turn is over. There are a couple of housekeeping things to do. One of them is that Mr. Balboa would return, and Andrew elected to put him at Santiago de Cuba, where Andrew will, will be buying some troops next turn. And we also need to eat. Pizarro's expedition eats up the food point, which it, it had gotten through diplomacy uh, action. So that's, uh, that's good. I can, uh, I can remove that from play. Everybody else, however, needs to do a die roll because they, they don't have any, any actual food. So the way that works is there is a, uh, a morale check table which you, uh, you use in this situation and also, also in certain others. Let me see if I can find it here. Where are we? There we go, the morale check table. Okay, and the result of that can be uh, morale hits. I decided in mine for my, my expedition, 
Almagro, he was in kind of bad shape because he was in a space with some mosquitoes, which subtracts one from this roll. So the card I have that I decided to play was the Doctor, which gives a plus one benefit in that. Also lets me, if I should take a morale hit, recover a point of morale. So basically everybody got through, the, I won't walk you through it all, but everybody got through these morale hits. It's pretty straightforward. Everybody got through these morale checks without losing any morale, which was was good. So that's the end of the turn, and that is one turn of the Conquistadors. At this point, we would draw new hands, and uh, Andrew would have the option to buy some troops there in, in Santiago de Cuba. He had a little bit of money saved up from the start of the game, by the way, which he could also use for that. And then we just proceed to an, uh, another turn, and we uh, we continue. I would be, at this point, attempting very hard to find an empire here that I could could get some gold from to match what Andrew has done here. And there might be a little bit of a competition down here to to try to to get that city as well so anyway that's what i wanted to show you we've touched on pretty much everything i think if you were to break the game open you could probably play it now from what we've talked about tonight although you'd be referring to the rules in a few places but you certainly would know enough to sit down and and have a have a learning game anyway i would be glad to take questions or comments john is rich again uh, on the plunder yeah, so it's no longer a city after it's plundered is oh, it true? is. It is. It is still a city. Absolutely. You can still do diplomacy with it, but it is hostile to you. And if it is plundered out, as happened with Cortez, then you can't plunder it anymore. You can still do diplomacy, although you will get less gold from it. But, okay. but and uh, what can, about moving through it? Well, it's a discovered space. So, yeah, it still counts as a discovered space. You can move okay. through it. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. I was trying to keep things simple and fast moving just on the theory that no one was going to want to spend the same kind of you know time and effort on this period as they would on say a new game about the battle of the bulge or normandy or whatever this just isn't a mainstream topic you know so my i was thinking maybe maybe more at consim world this might be something people would do while they were waiting for the other side to move in the big monster game they were playing you know something something more along those lines i can so see where this would be a lot of fun with multiple players yeah, that's really what it was designed for. and it, But it does work well with two as well, as you've seen. This is a two-player game that we were illustrating here. I hope everyone feels, feels it was time well spent. So thank you for, for coming out tonight.